it's uh, like I said earlier in my message. I don't, I can't promise anything about what's going to take place because if the fire of God comes on me, I'm just going to let Him flow. I always do. So He said He wants to talk about love today. I said love. He goes love. And then behind it, underneath, would be spirit and truth. Now He's been. Not just myself, there's many people right now preaching on the Holy Spirit, and this is the prelude to this movement. Mm. We've got to understand the Holy Spirit will be in control of this movement. And he will glorify Jesus Christ as the King of Glory to prepare the way for him to come back as the Lion of Judah. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you right now, Lord, to take control of this meeting, release your Holy Spirit, and fire from the throne of the King of Glory, Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask you, Lord, to glorify your Son today, to release spirit and truth. As Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and truth. Lord, let those mm -hmm. words be released today. Keep me out of it. Pull me back and just use me. I make that covenant with you. I always do. You, this, is, this is your temple. I join you in this temple. And I give you that place to use me in any way you want, Lord God. I ask you, Lord, to allow the people to hear and receive what you want to release today. And we just bless, we bless you, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that for protection over anybody who's not here or those that are on the way, but protection on everybody everywhere. No boundaries on any prayers ever, Lord God. Ever. You use your prayers whatever way you want, with whoever or whatever you choose, Lord God. You are God, and we honor you this way, with a fear which is a reverent awe that you are our God, and we love you because you loved us first. We bless you, Lord, this day. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to have your place, and Holy Spirit, take your place. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 So what is love? Hmm, interesting. God said, interactive. <laughs> I assume that means you guys are going to get involved in this, right? Okay, what is love? Now, when you answer, talk loudly so we can pick it up. What is love? God is love. Amen. God is love. But I said, what is love? We know God is love, but why is he love? Because our nature craves it. Okay, because he created it as in his image, and he is love, so therefore we are to love. That's why he said we love him because he first loved us. He created us in love. A lot of people don't hear that. They don't understand that because it's not taught. God created love. It's that simple. So why is it so hard to receive his love? Because the devil has sought to destroy his creation. Yeah. Think about it. He said he has to because God loved him. God loved Satan at the time, Lucifer, the beautiful one. That's what his name meant, beautiful one. He was in charge of the worship at the throne of God. But he let it get to him. And he became prideful. Okay? That's how in the garden, that's what happened in the garden, that that pridefulness came to destroy the love or communion. Adam and Eve was created by God as a communion to demonstrate us and him and him and us. Heart, mind, and soul as one. One accord. That's why it's so important, and I don't, I, the, the word unity is fine for people to come together, but in the family of God, unity is not a good thing because that means you, you can disagree with God and each other. Mm. Don't you find it interesting, the word of God, that when it talks about one heart, one mind, one soul, one body, one Lord, one God, one, one Savior, one Spirit, see? It's all one. One represents one accord. Accord. One means together. One. There's nothing but one. We have to be joined with God. We don't. We we believe God has to join with us. 
Mankind has been taught so many different things that they actually believe that we created God. You'd be surprised how many, how many Christians can't answer the question. Who is God? He's the creator. Okay? Because of the way people have been taught and stuff, the spiritual created the physical. And what got caught in the middle? Emotions. The mind. Okay? Heart. They got caught up in this. Okay? God created a movable tabernacle for himself. I holy, as we talked about, we had a meeting here last Saturday and we talked about 2 Chronicles 6 and 7, that we are a heavenly temple of sacrifice. Now, we talked a little bit about this, but the main thing I wanted to get to in that, that God wanted to release, and he did a good job releasing it, like I believe, but we're going to take it a little further today. Because that temple, that heavenly temple, is the key in it of sacrifice. That means God died for us, so we got to die to ourselves so he can live in us and live through us to bring the world back to him, as many as will receive. That's love. We are temples of love. Okay? It's a godly love. It is to be an unconditional love. But that's pretty hard to find. And that don't, don't be offended. Come on, we're human. We live fleshly bodies. And until we come into the perfection of Jesus Christ, that's the way it is. That's why God gave us Galatians 2.20. Come on. Two is the number of Jesus. Twenty is the testimony witness to fulfill and complete what he began. It's powerful. Not just a testimony. We become the witness to this. We become his love on earth by letting him move. When I first got saved, <laughs> I had trouble forgiving people and loving people because I was so full of anger and hatred from my childhood and growing up that it permeated and God saved me at 45 years old I was quite the mess and but what God did because I didn't know love I really didn't all I knew was the physical that was it and to me that's all that mattered but that's the deliverance that God took me through and brought me into the place of understanding what love really is Love is a godly, sovereign position. That's why we are heavenly temples of sacrifice. Because we've got to sacrifice the flesh to get into the godly love. Okay? We have to sacrifice what we desire and lust after to get into the godly love. That's why we have trouble sometimes receiving God's love as the Father. Jesus, we can, because I've, I've, I've not only experienced this, but I've talked to so many people over 25 years in all the traveling around where God took me in all these churches. I mean, it's amazing what is in the church. And I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church. This is what I've experienced since I've been saved. I didn't get saved until I was 45 years, so I got a lot of experience behind me the other way. And most of it not good. But now, at 45, God's taking me the other way, so I'm starting to see the other side of the spectrum. I know the cursed side. Boy, do I ever. Now, for 25 years, I've been learning the blessed side. That's the two spectrums of God's judgment. From Genesis to Revelation... Okay? Take the binder off the book because it started and then it's not going to end. But if you find in our Bibles, there's a binder on it so it ends. No, it's not going to end. It's eternal. Amen. Genesis was, was the Alpha. Revelation is not the Omega. Do you understand? Because there is no end to God. He's eternal. He began, but he never ends. The reason for the Omega is for us to understand the book of Revelation. What's coming? 
But God doesn't always tell us in between what he's going to do with us. If he had told me what he was going to do with me, I'd have gone the other way and gone back to the way I was. I'm sorry, that's the way I was when I got saved. But once I met the Lord Jesus Christ and he became my king, which is how I've been raised up. I've been raised up in the kingly anointing, understanding my king, Jesus Christ, the king of glory. He's raised me up this way. The Holy Spirit and the Father have ordained this to take place. I know him as my Lord. I know him as the Savior. I know him as the Son of God. Of course, I know these things too. But he raised me up in his throne to reveal his throne to his people in this movement. This movement is about him and us enthroned in him. Now, I've, I've spoken this before and talked about it, but I cannot find, nor can I find anybody who can help me find, because they can't find. The other Southerners, they, have, they can't find. They know of no, no movement of God ever that glorified Jesus Christ as the King of glory. So guess what this movement is about? The King of glory. And he's going to be revealed as sovereign. No question. Not only sitting in his throne, but the Father gave him his throne also. That's how sovereign our king is. And he is the king of love. King of love. Now, when I got saved, God asked me, he says, he says, are you willing, I mean, I was, I was maybe a month old in the Lord. And he says, are you willing to die for me? Oh, what? I just got saved. <laughs> he says, I told him, I said, I don't know. But it sure made me nervous. Never heard of such a thing. I mean, the devil tried long before I met the Lord. The devil had been trying to kill me my whole life. So, when he asked me that question, I actually had to think about it. You have to think about it too. Are you willing to die for him? And she said to me, are you, quote unquote Jesus, are you willing to die for me? And you can't just say yes. I'm sorry, you cannot. It's not allowed. Sorry. You're talking covenant here. Remember, we are heavenly houses of what? <clears throat> Sacrifice. Now, we are to die to ourselves. But what if it comes to a place you have to choose between your physical life or physical death? Are you willing to give your life up physically for Jesus Christ? For his gospel and the sake of his people? He already died for his people, but he can use you to die for other things. Are you willing to take a stand, forgive, and love those who hate you? Even if they kill you? Like Stephen? Who had, a, as the Bible says, he had the face of an angel. And they hated him. Because God used him to convict with spirit and truth. Do you remember who was standing there as they stoned him to death? Who was standing there holding the cloaks of the people while they stoned him to death? Saul. Paul. No. Saul. Saul. See, I was like a Saul. We're all like Saul's before he comes to the Lord. Even though God knows us, he knows us before we were formed in the womb of our mothers. He knows us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is to get you into the spiritual womb from the physical. It's to take and wash away and break the curse of the physical womb. And come into the spiritual womb of the Holy Spirit. That's why you go back into the water. That's what the discussion in John 3 was about when Jesus was talking with Nicodemus. What, can a man go back into his mother's womb again? Yes, the Holy Spirit. Become spiritual. And I know it's true because when I went into the water and I came out, everything was different. Just like the day that I got saved. God put me on the floor. He held me there. His finger, Jesus, his finger, I washed it. I knew it was Jesus. Don't tell me I, it had to be the Spirit because I had no clue who Jesus was. But I received Jesus and that, I watched that finger come right down out of heaven. And I thought it was going to hit me between the eyes. 
They came right down into my heart, touched my heart, put me on the ground, and I, to this day, I do not know how long I was on that ground. I know it was hours. And he showed me everything that was coming. And I knew I was downloaded. I knew whatever was in me was in me before he touched me, but it was released. When you get touched by God, your forced love is the release of the beginning of what God gave you long before you were ever born. Because he knows this before the foundation of the world. What the scripture says. He knows us before we're formed in the womb of our mothers. Why? Because he puts us there. We're God's creation. That's why we're his heavenly temple. Not just a temple of the Holy Spirit. We are heavenly temples of sacrifice. Jesus was our demonstration. He was our example. Of what can be done if you choose to be a heavenly temple of sacrifice. The sacrifice is love. That you love God so much that you are willing to die to yourself till you can actually get to a place like Paul after his conversion. I wonder, like Paul when he says, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. I haven't got to that place. But I intend to get there because I know God will get me there. There's still flesh in me. God's still working with me. He's still taking me through deliverance. First three years I met the Lord, he took me through extreme deliverance, day and night, for three solid years. To this day, I cannot tell you how many spirits were removed from me. But boy, did it change me. I became a walking miracle. Today, I'm still a walking miracle. Even with all the problems I got, I'm still a walking miracle. The devil's still trying to kill me, but cannot. Cannot. During the sicknesses and illnesses that I've gone through over the last almost nine years now, I have headed, tried to head home 12 times, and each time I got sent back. Three times in one day. May 24th, 2013. I bled to death three times. My body, my stomach, and my belt were completely filled with my own blood. I died in my home. I died in the aid car and I died in the emergency room. And I used up every drop of blood they had because they couldn't get it in me fast enough. All, every vessel in my throat was breaking open. The devil was trying to either shut me up or kill me. He, was told, he wanted me dead, but cannot kill me. To this day, he cannot kill me. He cannot kill you unless the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit says so. God is the determination who dies and who does not. The devil does not have the power to make that decision. <clears throat> Nor do you. I'm sorry you don't. I know a lady who drank as a teenager would try to commit suicide. And she drank a can of Drano. Now you know what Drano is, right? It cleans out the pipes. It's acid. She lost all her feelings. She couldn't feel heat. She couldn't feel cold. It messed her up. But she could not die. And did not die. Because God had a plan for her. Now I got to meet her 30 years after this. Maybe a little bit more than that. I'm guessing that. Raise your question. I know she was at least in her 40s. And boy, she was powerful in the Lord. And ministering to many, many people, especially youth, especially with her testimony. Nobody can kill you, nothing can kill you, unless God is the one who releases the ability to take your breath. We are heavenly temples. We have to understand that when God reveals himself, especially to you. It's for the glory of his son before he's done. Whether somebody rejects or receives, it does not matter. They will still be used for the glory of Jesus Christ. 
There's a lot of misconceptions about the Word of God that's going to get talked about today. I've talked about it off and on here and there about Jesus and how He really is. He is a righteous God, and He must judge righteously. Or He has to apologize. He even spoke about it in the Scriptures. Our God is a just God, but He is also a righteous judge. And he must judge sin. He doesn't have a choice. But he is a God of a love that we can barely understand. People think they understand his love, but they don't because it's beyond us. It's so unconditional, that's what makes him a righteous judge and a just God. Because he is not a respecter of person. He cannot be. That makes him conditional. So when God said, I need to love, I said, Lord, I don't know how. He said, do this. Let me love through you as you learn what I'm doing. And it worked. Took a while. Because he had to deliver me at the same time. So every time God would deliver me of something... He would put love in its place and show me what to do. So whenever I pray deliverance on myself or someone else, or somebody prays deliverance for me or someone else, I'm praying, Lord God, get that place that just got emptied out. Get it filled with your Holy Spirit. Get it filled with the blood of the Lamb. Wash it down and purge it with the fire of the Holy Spirit and take possession of it. So it cannot get filled with anything else. These are the kind of prayers God raised me up with. He raised me up in the spirit realm to know what goes on in the spirit realm. And it's amazing what happens in the spirit realm that the physical has no clue of. <coughs> when God has me do deliverance on people and stuff, I, I, first thing I do, work, especially working with broken heartedness, emotional trauma with people, which makes us puppets to the devil because it's demonically caused. And believe it or not, one of the things God has shown me that, that the thick curtain that was made of many layers represents the brokenheartedness, the emotional traumas that keep us from God, from getting into the holiest of holies, because we don't feel worthy. Because of the shame, guilt, and condemnation of what we've been through. And we take the responsibility for what the devil did, and we have nothing to do with it. I learned this one. It took me three years to forgive my mom for things that happened in my life as a youth. And then I came to a point where, because I, God was teaching me how to love her, I always respected her, but I didn't always love what she did. She was my mom. Okay? Well, when I got saved, I understood it's not her fault. I actually became like her. And she became like her mom. And her mom became like her mom. Which are some of the things I found out talking to people. <clears throat> we look at people and we judge according to where we've been instead of where we are first. Mm -hmm. But God always takes us to the omega part of what we learned in the alpha of our life. That's why he's the Alpha and Omega. That's why he said, I came to bind up the broken heart. I came to set the captives free. We are captives within ourselves. We are children. God breathed us, in, he breathed into us and made us a child, a living soul. So we can be childlike. We're children of God. He's our Father. <coughs> Jesus is not only the Son of God, He's our brother. That's what helps me to understand him more than anything. Because he stands with me. He's my older brother and he stands up for me. When things happen, even to this day, when things happen, he says, it's okay. I got this. Trust me. That's my older brother talking to me. Not just God, that and Lord and King. That's my big brother talking to me. Telling me it's okay. 
That's what big brothers are about. I didn't have a big brother. I got one now. And boy, is he a big brother. <laughs> oh, yeah, even to me. And we have a lot of fun together. Walking with the Lord is not always fun. Anybody that says it is, praise God. Watch out for the curves. That's right. But he is a great God. And he loves having fun. And I love wrestling with him. I love having fun with the Holy Spirit. He loves, he's the oil of joy. He loves having fun. So does our father. I know this as a father and a grandfather, and someday hopefully a great-grandfather. God has given us love. Love is enjoying your children. God, love is enjoying your family. And you know, you know one of the biggest things that pulls people down from the love of God and His joy sometimes? Family. It's amazing, the majority of the worries that I've run into people with, number one, family. And yet, if you have proclaimed Joshua 24, 15, Choose ye this day whom you're going to serve as for me and my house. We, not I, we will serve the Lord. Do you know what that means? That bloodline belongs to Jesus. Period. You just made covenant with God that your family is his family. Now, look at the other side of that spiritually. You're talking about the family of God now. And God uses this on me. When I was in Spokane, or when we were in Washington State, I grew up in Spokane, basically. I, I was in Denver, born in Holyoke, Colorado, lived in Nebraska, born in Holyoke, Colorado, which is God, and at eight years old moved me to Washington State. But when I was, and, and believe me, it, it, it's a war. No matter where you go anymore, it's a war. But there are places that are worse than others, believe me. Washington State is considered to be the least church state in the Union. Hmm. And when it comes to witchcraft, it's within the top ten areas in the world of witchcraft. Coven activity. Seattle. It's in King County. We need to get in the spirit. This last time Sean and I went to Washington, God was teaching us things and showing us things to bring back here. And what God does here, we take back there. So God is using us to network the two states together and the people of God. I don't know what it's all about yet. I can't tell you. All I know is I see God told us this. I'm going to use the two of you to network or knit these two states together. And the portals in both states is Seattle and Chicago. Not Olympia and not Springfield. The two portals to hell. And they are open portals. Chicago is wide open, unknown, and everybody knows. But Seattle had been hidden. But the coronavirus was used by God to expose them. And the sister city in Oregon, Portland, not Salem, Portland. They are a three strand pyramid connection. Mm. Like a, a, what do they call it? A triangle? A, yeah, you know, like a Bermuda like Triangle. There's a Sea of Japan triangle. There's three of them on the earth. This is a triangle in the physical that suppresses spirit and truth to release the demons of Antichrist. And so, in the process of what's happening, God told us, I want you to go call my family back together into one accord. It's not enough for them to come together in unity. He says, I'm done with that. 
I will have my way with my body. He is the head. He is not a figurehead. He is the head of the body. And we must give him place. And you cannot do that if you cannot receive the fullness of the Father's love. Because Jesus Christ is the manifestation of the Father's love. That's why Jesus continuously told us, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The problem with the church is they're not a Thomas. What? You mean the doubter? No, he was not the doubter. Philip was the doubter. Philip's the one who Jesus rebuked. Not Thomas. On the contrary, God showed me he was delighted with Thomas because that's what he wants from the church. And that bears out the teachings of Matthew 7 and Luke 6 about building on a sand or the rock. Matthew 7 is Philip. Luke 6 is Thomas. Thomas' name in Hebrew is Didymus. Almost sounds like Dunamis, doesn't it? Power of God. Didymus. Anybody know what Didymus means? Twin. Twin. Christ-like. Mirrored image. Is that not what Jesus says? A mirror is used twice in the Bible. One, you look at and you walk away and you forget what you saw because you saw it dimly. Hello, that's Philip. The other one is Jesus is our mirror because of his DNA. He changes us into his likeness. This is why I teach, go look in the mirror, look for Jesus. Don't look at you, look at him in you. And it will change your life. Do it every day. Do it in the morning when you get up and thank God for the day and declare it his. Declare glory through the whole day. And at night, thank Him for what He did that day. And you'll wake up with thanksgiving on your heart. It's like you go to, you go to bed with a worship song, you wake up with a worship song. You will. God created us this way. What is communion? <clears throat> Love. Why? Because two become one. C-O-N means two. becomes one. You add to it. Communion. Coming together as one in one accord. Communion is one accord. It is not unity. Hello, brother. It's not unity. Unity is something you come together, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're one. One accord, you are in together. You agree. You ever had an argument with God? Did you win? No. <laughs> I'd say why, but I'm just going to say one. Because the argument wasn't his way. But that's what makes us his children. Your children ever argue with you? You ever argue with your mom and dad? <laughs> oh, come on. You know, if you think the physical is bad, you should see the spiritual with the teenagers. I'm, I'm serious. The physical is a manifestation of what goes on in the spirit realm. The same thing that happens in the spirit physical goes on in the spiritual. If you don't think so, go to church sometime and really listen to what people are talking about. And you'll find out the majority of conversations is not about God. It's about them. Especially if they're upset with God. We all have a long ways to go, but we are still moving forward. Jesus Christ is still in control. The blood of God is still in us, on us, and around us. It is still changing us because it's DNA. And if you don't think it happens in the spirit realm, what is it happening in the physical? So you just went from being born to senior, right? Well, that's Alpha and Omega. But it doesn't work that way, does it? The spirit realm is no different. That's right. God can make us whole just like that. But he doesn't. Why? 
because he loves us too much. And he loves everybody else too much. You know why I said that? Because God's got to change you to use you to change others. Amen. Amen. So it's about, that's love. It's to give what you know to be good to those that need that, that don't have it or don't understand it or cannot receive it. You help them come into the place that they can. You speak spirit and life to them. You encourage them. You lift them up. You pray for them. You do war for them. You sacrifice yourself for them. That's God in you. Because if you're doing it, if anybody's doing this, and they have not Christ in them, then that's works without faith. And yet if you have Jesus in you, and you're not doing these things, then that's faith without works. And that's dead also. Or it says in James. James 1. Talked about it both ways. Works without faith, and faith without works is dead. God wants us to come to a place that we believe in Him so much that we're called the friend of God, like Abraham. <clears throat> we're coming into a position in the Lord as His family that He is going to require much from us. Do you know why? Do you really know what God has given you? Somebody look up Ephesians 1.17 in the King James, please. And I'm going to have you come forward and read it. I want you to know who you are in Jesus Christ. In the love of the Father, Jesus Christ. That is His love. He is the symbol of the love of the Father for us. That's how much He loved us. That He gave His only begotten Son. That we can become sons and daughters with Him to the Father. And Jesus does not have a problem with it. No more than the Father had a problem with Jesus being equal to him. And the King James said, did not consider it, he did not consider it robbery to be equal to God. Why? Because he is God. But the Father gave him that place. That's why the Father used him to give us the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The first promise of the Father... In Genesis, or, uh, Galatians 2, I believe it is, is the first act of the Father was to give us a son. Give us a new covenant. He gave us conversion. Yesterday we had a meeting at Esther's house and God brought up, it was a teaching on conversion. It'll be on the internet this week. Or this coming week. If I get to him. It'll be conversion. A day of conversion. It's yesterday was the beginning. 20th, 3, the Godhead, 20, testimony witness that he's going to fulfill and complete what he did. And we got to have a great expectation, 21. And what is the year? 20, testimony witness, fulfill and complete, that we can have great expectations in God and what he's about to do. He's about to change the world one last time before he comes back. That's why billions are going to get saved. Yes, I said billions. Amen. The sower of seed says one in four were saved. I'm praying for one, at least one third. Well, if it's one third, then that's three billion people. I'm praying for even more than that. Especially if there's going to be a great falling away that the Bible talks about. I pray to God that there is a half of the population of the world get saved. So those who are predestined that Jesus has known before you were born, that he knew would come to him, don't get touched Amen. in a falling away. But I pray for all those who fall away that they die in salvation. I made that prayer with my children and my grandchildren. Lord, if any of them loses their salvation or are going to lose it, take their life before they do. And I meant it. I meant it. That is a father's love, which God taught me. God will save as many as he can, but he does give free choice. 
But you've got to learn to stand on the promises of God like you never have before. Who's got Ephesians 1.17? And here's why. Here's why. Talk real loud. Come on up here. No. I knew it was somebody that God wanted up front in front of the camera. So come on up here. For those that don't know, this is Tom. Read it loudly. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation in the knowledge of him. Keep going. Now go to uh, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. How much did he give us? Do you understand what the word all means? We say it, we, but we never examine it. Have you ever done a search on the word all? Go do it. It will change your perspective of the gospel. While you're at it, look up the word great. How humans see the word. And then consider what God means concerning these two words. We sing a song about how great our God is. One of my favorite songs. How great is your God? That's a question you need to write and put on your walls wherever you are. How great is my God? How do you see your God? And how much, literally, and put on the, remember, He gives me all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Did you catch that? What was that last part? In heavenly, heavenly places. places. And what are you? A heavenly temple of sacrifice. <laughs> now you see what Jesus did for us? You think he just saved us. No, no, no. He got us all the Father's spiritual blessings and put them into heavenly places. Do you get that? Amen. Amen. Do you understand what you have within you? You don't just have the Lord Jesus Christ enthroned in you. You've got the Godhead in you. And according to Ephesians, or to... Uh, Colossians 2.9, you have the fullness of the Godhead in you. Oh, kind of backs up that other scripture, doesn't it? Now you understand what Ephesians 1.17, that is the mind of Christ. It is the greatest explanation of the mind of Christ right there. I wish you all had the spirit of wisdom and revelation about God. Earlier today, and he caught me by surprise because I didn't really, I, I've heard the word, but I never really knew what it meant. And he had me look it up after I got here. He says, my people are frivolous. What? Frivolous. Frivolous. Oh, frivolous. F-R-I... Anyhow. If you start, if you type it on the internet, I went on the internet and looked it up real quick and it pulled it up. It knew the word better than I did. <laughs> so, it's, it's good to have things that, that are a little smarter than we are. That's why we got the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, in the process of, of, of I, I looked it up and I said, oh my God, Lord, is that really your body? He goes, yeah. He says, you'd be surprised how many things my people do that mean nothing or they're, they're um, diminished concerning the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Mm. Wow. Now, don't be angry at me. God gave it to me. i got to speak it out. Yeah. God asked me to speak a lot of things that make some people upset and stuff. But you know what? Being upset causes you to take a look at it when you calm down. <laughs> I know this one for fact. <laughs> so it's not a rebuke no God just wants you to examine your life look people our lives are done what we've been doing is over what your church has been doing 
for God only knows how long, is, is going to come to a stop. It's done. He's done with religion. Amen. I don't know how many times I heard it began with one simple enough, real quiet. This started years ago, probably maybe 10 years ago. But since I've come to Chicago, it, it gets shouting, boisterous. Enough! Enough! The last time there was three of them. Enough! And it shook me. And I knew it shook the world at the same time in the spirit realm. That's the pre prelude to this movement. But the movement cannot happen until God's people are in place. This is why the judgment of God begins at the house of God first. I'm not talking about a church building. I'm talking about His people. Man built churches. God built men. Now I'm talking men and women. I'm talking about the heart. I'm not talking about a man. I'm not talking about a woman. I'm talking about a heart. If people understood who Adam and Eve represented, they represented in the spirit realm the heart and the mind. And to be in one accord, it said in the Bible, the Father searches the range, the mind, and the heart to see if they're in one accord. It has to do with the heart of Jesus, the key of David in the New Testament, not the old. That's a, that's a fleshly heart. David's heart was fleshly, but he loved God. God wants to get us beyond us. The new covenant is about receiving the heart of Jesus. Not David. That's a heart after the lost. And to secure his body as one. And bring them into a place that they can receive the mind of Christ. In the Holy Spirit to release him in your lives. To bring a holy fire to purge you first and then release it to help others by using that fire to consume the enemy. Because our God is a consuming fire. Am I staying within the perimeters or am I in trouble? Craig, am I okay? I wanted to make sure. Do you understand what's being said to you? Who has the mind of Christ? If you don't believe you do, you need to get to God and find out why. If you don't believe God loves you with an unconditional love, you need to get to God and find out what sin you have going on. Because sin is a wedge between you and God's love. Not you and God. No, that's a lie. Between you and God's love. Because Jesus came to take care of that sin concerning God. That's why we got Isaiah. I believe it's 9. I can't remember where it's at now. I know it's in Isaiah where it says, Though your sins may be as, as scarlet, which is blood red, they shall be as white as snow. That's what Jesus did with the blood of the Lamb. He gave us his blood to cover us while his DNA changes us and the Holy Spirit builds us up. And nobody can receive the Holy Spirit without a blood covenant with Jesus. It's impossible. You will have a spirit guide or a familiar spirit that will act like the Holy Spirit, but it is not. If you do not have the confession, not recital, confession from your heart that Jesus is Lord in your life, you cannot have the Holy Spirit baptism. It's a false teaching. If you're going to pray for somebody to get the Holy Spirit, you better make sure that person has prayed for us because I saw somebody who was not saved who got a familiar spirit when they prayed for him to get the Holy Spirit because he wasn't saved. And he got a devil. Hmm. <coughs> And he started manifesting. He took, there were seven pastors, or seven men, I should say, that tried to hold him down and couldn't. And a little old grandma came in. And she said, that's enough. She came up and she said, in the name of Jesus, get out. And that man laid still. How do you think those seven men felt? Mm -hmm. They reminded me of the sons of Sceva. Uh. One's fear. 
and someone who was not saved. But they wanted to do what Jesus did. Well, there's no difference in a church today. But the love of God is so strong and so... It's challenging. Do you know that God challenges with His love? His love is to challenge us to become like His Son, who is the representative of His love. So why did Jesus say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? This is a good, good, good place to go, Lord. What makes you look like someone else? Why does your family all look similar? DNA. And what is the DNA? Jesus. It's the characteristics of God. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. Not a person. God. Because he created everybody. He is the God of creation. It's the one thing Satan cannot do. He cannot recreate. Amen. Cannot. Though they're trying, they can clone, but they cannot recreate because they cannot have a living soul in them. Because only the breath of God can do that. And that, by the way, these clones do not have eternal life. Mm. Anybody that God has breathed into has eternal life. It's a false teaching. Receive Jesus and receive, receive eternal life. Yeah, well, everybody has eternal life. They just don't teach it that way. They use only half the truth. That's why Jesus, he spoke both sides. And we need to start doing the same. Because it says in Jude, it talks about with some having compassion with others, with fear, pulling them out of the fire with the truth. Jesus told me when I got saved, if I were to come back today, half the people in the church would die and go to hell. Because I do not know them. He says half the pastors, he said more than half the pastors are not ordained to me. I do not know them as pastors. I have not ordained them to be in the position they, they went to school and got a certificate. Or even online now. And you wonder why there's so many divisions of the, of, quote unquote, the church on the earth. And why there's so many religions. Because the devil heard Jesus say, a house divided against the south cannot stand. Now you understand why the Lord is sending people out right now with a message, get back together in one accord. Mm -hmm. We have to. Because we're going to need each other in what's coming. And God's got to get us ready. So if you're going through things, you need to start praising God. And I'm one that needs to start praising Him even more because I'm going through a whole lot and so is Sean. Because God's got to get everybody ready. Everybody has a position in the body. I don't care who you are. Everybody has a position in the body of Jesus Christ. And you know who He renders the most valuable in Corinthians. If there is a problem in the church, the Word of God says, seek the least esteemed person to judge. They got nothing to lose. <laughs> now, we've seen that play out in the Bible, haven't we? We are coming to a place that you got to lay you down. So you can be crucified with Christ. Not to die, but to become spirit. On the cross, if you really take a look at the cross, Jesus had already shed his blood. They whipped him. They tore out. I mean, he was so mangled. People don't understand that even his beard was pulled out. This is why that, the movie The Passion was so powerful. I went to go see it. 
And people, I mean, they were crying and crying out to stop in the theater. I mean, they were being tormented by what they saw their Lord going through. It changed their lives. We need to really take a good look at the cross and what it was about. It wasn't him just giving his life. It was him laying his life down. To teach us, we must become a heavenly house, temple of his sacrifice. We must lay ourselves down for Jesus. Put away the frivolous things in our life that is taking up God's time that could be used doing something else. We've been raised up this way. It's going to be hard to break this. In many situations, it's actually a curse. Sometimes it's a spell and magic, which the difference between them is, is one makes something look good, the other makes it seem good, or it causes you to see it as good. One is outside, one is inside. One is how you see it, the other is how it's perceived. And the devil uses it on everybody, especially God's family. We've got to be very, very wise as it's, Jesus said, be wise as a serpent, as harmless as a dove. We've got to be very wise in what we're thinking, saying, and doing. God gave me a vision once when I first got saved, and he said, this is the state of my church. And this is one of the reasons, I'm going to tell you right now before I tell you this, this is one of the reasons why I correct people when I hear what they're saying. Yeah, they get mad at me. I get, I'm, people get mad at me all the time. But you know what? I'd rather have them mad at me than have a petition against them by Satan because of what they're saying or how they're saying. God told me when I got saved, he said, I'm making my whipping post. And I said, what do you mean? He says, my people are going to mad at you because you're going to speak what I tell you to speak. But I want my people changed, especially their tongues. I want a bridle on their tongues. So I pray constantly for God to put the bridle of the Holy Spirit on our tongues, mine included. That we speak spirit of life and nothing else. And like God has me preaching, you know, the first thing, you, if Jesus is the first thing in your heart, if he's the treasure of your heart, why isn't he the first thing spoken out of your mouth? We've got to recognize the love of God is so great that he is willing to lay his love down for us that we can pick it up. And apply it. That's what going to the cross. That's what Galatians 2.20 is about. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I die not. But the life I live now in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave his life for me because he loves me. The key in that is the faith of the Son of God, which is without measure according to John 3.32. Because the faith is the Holy Spirit. So the measure of faith that you have is according to how much place you give to the Holy Spirit to trust Him and give Him place of obedience. The vision that I got was I seen a room. It was about actually this size. But it's all white walls. No windows, just white walls. And where I was standing, I was in the room and off to my left over here was a door. And it was open just a tiny bit, but I could see through it. And I could see on the other side in the spirit, I could see there was a yellow tape across, you know, like a police, you know. Mm -hmm. And it said, do not enter. Okay? <coughs> do not enter. And as I looked, I saw a court. I saw the throne of God. The interesting thing was, the Father was sitting there, but I saw Jesus also. Remember, Jesus gave all things into his hand or under his foot. And then I saw Jesus also over here as our counselor, our lawyer. Because beyond that wall, you know, they got that little bar thing. Okay, that's the bar, so anything on the other side, you're a counselor. Though it's starting to change. But in the old days, they were called counselor. On the outside of, the, outside of that, they were called a lawyer. So God has a, a line. He's drawn a line. And we've got to understand that God is bringing everything to his throne now. Because the devil has so many petitions against God's people. It isn't funny. And so as I watched, I saw the devil. And he's petitioning against us. Well, 
I looked and I saw all these papers. I mean, different stacks, almost to the ceiling in some places. And it's like this invisible, it's like there was an invisible something. It wasn't physical, but it was there. And it's like it separated this room in two pieces. And both sides, just full of these papers. Not no furniture, just nothing but stacks of papers. And I said, Lord, what am I looking at? He says, you're looking at all the petitions against my people for what they're saying and how they're saying it. And he said, there's going to come a day, because the devil is pushing that day, that I will open that door, I will take that tape off, which is his hand. And he's not allowing those petitions, giving us opportunity to change. Hmm. But the Lord said, there is an end to all grace. And it's true. When Jesus comes back, it's too late. It's too late. The millennial kingdom is about those who made a decision. It's not about making a decision. It's about those who already made the decision to receive him. We've got to recognize that we have loose tongues. The church is full of every kind of witchcraft you can imagine from God's people, talking about God's people, or about God himself. You'd be surprised how many people who are doing witchcraft, literally in covenants and stuff, are ex-Christians. It's amazing what goes on in the church that God's people don't see because they don't receive the Holy Spirit and what he says. I know a church that fell because of this. And I said, Lord, where are the prophets? This is a world-renowned church in Wenatchee. Where the pastor took the money, bought diamonds, and left. I said, where were the prophets? It became a curse to the whole valley. And boy, I mean, people to this day are still bitter about what happened. Some of them are intercessors. Why couldn't they hear God telling them? Because they wouldn't, they could, they would not believe, they could not believe that their pastor would do such a thing. Well, his, their pastor was a man. I hate to say it, a white sepulchre. Somebody following God and God's graces and goodness and, and his will to be done would never do such a thing. It has to be a white sepulcher or a tear to do such a thing to the people of God. But God sent me to Wenatchee to deal with these things. Boy, I'll tell you what, they were not happy with me. But they got the picture but they still would not give up the bitterness. And they wondered why they couldn't do the things of God that God did when he was here. Why aren't we all out on the streets doing miracles? Because most people aren't going to come to the Lord until they see the miracles. I'm sorry, it's true. Like John 5, Jesus said, if you don't believe me for the words that I speak, believe me for the things that I did that are from the Father. And you're talking Jews here. Even leadership. They followed him everywhere. People don't pay attention to that. They did. He was followed wherever he went. They were scrutinizing him. And do not believe that you will not be scrutinized. I hear many things about me and what, what's being said. If I'm wrong, come to me and say it. Don't do it behind my back. You got a problem with being said, come to me. I'll sit down with you. If you can't come, call me. My phone is readily available. It's God's phone, day or night. We need to all be that way. We need to speak spirit and truth with the boldness and confidence of Paul, who'd been accused of pride. He ain't prideful, but he was accused of pride. And to this day, I still hear being free. Paul was proud. No, he was not. He was bold. And he was confident in what God gave him. He knew the truth. Yes. 
Because he lived by the Spirit of God day and night. Why are we not like Paul? He laid his life down more than once. Back then they were so angry at Paul they put him on an island. They isolated him. They tried to do it in Rome and look what God did. God gave him his own house and a soldier to watch him, I believe, who got saved to talk to the Jews to get them saved. Three years, he had his own place. He did not pay for it because he was under arrest. Caesar paid for it. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> you get it? But look at his travels to get there. Look what God did with him. Look at that walk of Jesus in that man. Why are we more like that? Because we're so busy in what we're doing, sometimes we don't got... Time to take a look at the adventure of the trail of the Lord and what he wants to do. God's shifting everybody. I don't care who you are. In one form or other, everybody's being shifted because God loves us so much, he's got to get us out of our comfort zones. We have built our lives up around our comfort. And we have bought and done things and set ourselves in places. And I'm not going to say God wasn't involved because God does these things. But God also will change you. When you get too comfortable, God's going to move you. He's going to move you. And I'll tell you why He's going to move you. Because the fire He's going to put in you will consume what's around you if He doesn't. So He'll give you opportunity to release it. And if you don't, He's going to take it. And that's a warning to the entire body of Christ. You guys better start listening. The whole church needs to listen that God's moving. But he's going to get his people in position before he releases. And you're going to be surprised who's going to end up being used by God the most. The sacrifice will be the key. Who has been faithful and true to God? For 12 years, God has been testing his people. 12 years until January 1, January 1 this year. This is the year you're going to find out whether you've been faithful or true to God over the last 12 years. 12 is the number of divine order. It isn't that he knows. He already knows. He wants us to know. You'll know them by their fruit. It's not just the prophetic. It's everybody. Who has been number one in their lives for 12 years, we're about to see by what God gives to who. And how he chooses to use them. Now God is a righteous judge. He is a just God. And he is a God of the greatest love. And the greatest example of love there will ever be. Ever. Ever. And nobody can ever love the way that God does. It's impossible. Because we're still in the flesh. It's impossible. Even Paul found that out. So did David. Major characters of God, they all found it out. They cannot love the way God does. But God can love them and let his love flow through them until they can. And it changes everybody. It changes everything around you. Why do you think wherever Jesus went, why do you think people manifested wherever he went? Because he was God? No. Because he was love. That's why Jesus was not afraid to speak the truth. Didn't matter who he was talking to. He was talking to everybody. Those words of Jesus, the earth is still turning in them. He showed it to me. The earth is turning in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was here. His footprints still affect this earth today. That's why they can't do away with him because they are permanent until it passes away. You get that picture? People think they've got to go to Jerusalem to feel Jesus. No. <laughs> if he lives in you, Amen. and it's his temple, then that means your feet are his feet. Right? Your hands are his hands. You got the mind of Christ, the heart of Jesus, 
The temple is holy. It's heavenly. The sacrifice is in you already. The question is, as he keeps telling me to ask this question, what are you going to do with it? And what are you going to do with him who lives in you? Are you really willing to do whatever he wants? I know at one point or other, most of us, if not all of us, have said, whatever you want, Lord, here I am. Have your way. Oh, my God, what deadly and very serious words. Because you're making covenant with God. The deadly is you got to die to yourself because you said do whatever you want. Huh? That's the cross, is it not? Galatians 2.20. That's the will of God. Here I am, Lord. Yeah, whatever you want, Lord, it's okay. See, when you make covenant with God, the first time you said to Jesus, you made covenant. You made covenant with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Every time after that, that God says, do you love me? Will you obey me? Do you trust me? But he's talking to you. And you made covenant with him one time. That's eternal. That's eternal. God doesn't break their covenant. Only we, actually, we can't break it either. Only the devil can get us to break it. And the only way you can do that is if the devil gets you to question and can talk you out of it. The devil has no power to change you but what you give him. But when you made that covenant with Jesus, he has all the power to change you whenever he wants. And you have nothing to say about it. I know that gets, goes against a lot of theologies, but you know what? You said yes once to Jesus Christ. You made a covenant with him. And the Father's will will be done in your life no matter what it takes. And like the difference between being called, he calls us all, but there are those that he chooses. Many are called, but few are chosen. Why? Because the called will not lay their lives down for Jesus. And please don't take that wrong. Don't be offended, but it's true. Predestination is the will of God. God did not make Judas do what he did. Judas chose to do that, but Jesus knew he would. So he said to him, go do what you have to do. He didn't say, go do what you were ordained to do. Go fulfill my Father's will. No, he said, go do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Critical how we see things. And we got to be that wise to be that harmless, to know the truth in how we speak. And if you will do that and give that place to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will speak through you like Jesus. Because Jesus will be speaking. He is the voice of prophecy. And anything he says is prophetic. But it's also law. Jesus fulfilled the old covenant, which could not get us to heaven because it was animal's blood. But that's why Jesus became known as the lamb, because lambs are innocent. And he was innocent. He had no sin. So as a lamb, his blood fulfilled the law of animal's blood. Being God, he was our Savior. He was the Anointed One, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. And in that, he brought the blood of the Father. Did you catch that? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Again, I go back to the question, what makes us look like someone else? Mm. DNA. When we get the concept and the precept of what God set before us, the love behind it, love is a four-letter word given to the body and bride of Jesus. One is the Father, two is the Son, three is the Holy Spirit who reveals the Godhead. Four is the number of the body and bride of Christ. <clears throat> Just coincidence. No, God set it up. Because God used mathematics to do all things. To set everything in premise. As he chose. It is solid. And nothing moves without God. 
God is in control of the entire universe. He created. Period. What do you think holds things in place? God's perfect will. He gave us a son that causes things to grow upward. That's you will. He gave us a son, that's the one that causes us to ascend. In the Bible, trees represent characteristics of people. In the body of Christ, we grow up like trees with our branches growing upward with holy hands, with healing in its leaves. As the river of God flows through us, the throne flows out of us and brings forth the fruit of the trees to the people. As in Jeremiah 17, we don't die when there's a drought of the Word of God or water because we're planted by the river that flows out of the throne of God, the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's why we can have life and life abundantly. <coughs> Not just life. That's in the blood, but in the Holy Spirit, we get life abundantly. That's why the Father, the Father has the sword in His hand and it's His Son and the Holy Spirit. Galatians 2, Acts 1, boom! And in the Father's hand, fire. That's why the cloven tongues, the Holy Spirit and fire from the Father and the Son, boom! Holy Spirit from the Father through the Son, the Holy Fire from the Son through the Father. John 14, 26 and John 15, 26. And 27 is the summation of that, that He knew us from the foundation of the world. The body of Christ needs to get excited. Okay. And they need to wake up and realize what has been given to us and why are we using them. Everybody has been given the same thing in Christ Jesus when it comes to the promise of God in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. In Christ Jesus. That's how we got it. In Christ Jesus. Or Jesus Christ, either way. Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Christ means his anointing, the Holy Spirit. The mantle that came down to Elisha. From Elijah. Jesus, giving us the Holy Spirit. That's why the dove descended upon him. That was fulfilling the word in Kings. To show us physically. Here comes the Holy Spirit like a dove descending from heaven. Well, here comes the mantle to Elisha who did twice as much as Elijah. And Jesus said, greater things than ye shall do, right? That's the double portion of Elijah and Elisha. And Jesus went up in a fiery chariot. Why? Because he's the king of glory. He went up to be glorified. He came back and gave the Holy Spirit, the river, from his throne within us. Now you know why we're heavenly temples of sacrifice. He sacrificed so we could have the things of the Father. And he gave to his Son, who presented them to us by receiving him. That's why he came out of the world and said, The kingdom of heaven and reaches, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because all things were put in his hand. He's telling them what's going to happen. You receive me, you get everything. And yet we don't use it. We just use pieces of it. We haven't even touched. 99% of the stuff we haven't even touched. But I can guarantee you this right now from what God's been telling me and showing me, especially lately. He's been showing me these things for almost 15 years. He spoke to me when I got saved and showed me what was coming. And it's coming. It's here. And I guarantee you, it's not going to be all pleasing. But at the same time, God's going to move. And all these promises of the Father given through His Son to those in Him are going to rise up in every single gift of the Father. And we're going to start not just living in them. We're going to start walking in them and moving in them on the streets the people won't have to come into the church. Church got to go to them. That's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't make them come to him. He went to them. 
The land had been walked and prayed for, intercessed, anointed, shofar, blown, you name it. It's been done over this country for generations. Now it's time for God, and that's why 21, the number 21 is the number of great expectations of God. We are to expect great things from Him this year. And we're going to see things move and things happen that we have not seen before. And you're going to be surprised who God's going to use. It's not going to be the big names like we used to. It's going to be everyone Amen. who believes. Amen. And I'm going to take you to a, a, a word that was spoken at D.D. Coon's church a couple weeks ago. And it still rattles around in me. And God will not let me let go of it. Because he wants his people to examine themselves. Like the Bible says, we must prepare ourselves for what God's about to do. And the best way to prepare is get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit have his way. Do you trust God? Boy. Do you trust God? Yes. Then why do you act like you don't? It shook the place when it was spoken. It still shakes me. We need to examine, first of all, do we really trust God with anything and everything? Oh. The second thing is, how great is your God? Is He trustable? And we need to write them down so we can see them and examine ourselves every time we see it. Because that will remind us that we're on a path of convergence. Because he's going to convert us. Convergence is where it comes together. So the day of conversion yesterday is becoming the days of convergence. Bringing things together for his glory that we can be prepared by God himself for what he needs us to become in order for us to receive the fullness of what God has for us, to glorify Jesus Christ this time by following and giving the Holy Spirit not 30, 60, or, or 100%, but 1,000%. Everything, everything, everything. Our thoughts, our breathing, everything must be a blessing to Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit will teach us how to do this. So the fire of God, when it moves, it will be moving in us, and it will move us. To glorify Jesus Christ, this time as the King of glory, because he's sovereign. And we sit in his throne, if you're obedient. I hear it taught that everybody sits in, in heavenly places. No, you don't. It's not true. It's a false teaching. It's scratching at your ears. It's a lie. You've got to recognize who our God really is, and that includes Jesus Christ. Everybody says the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. Yeah, he's pretty gentle. But remember something. God is the one who sent, Jesus Christ is the one who sent the Holy Spirit and told him to take the life of Ananias and Sapphira. Jesus Christ was enthroned. He had the authority and power of God to declare their breath to be taken, and it was taken by the Holy Spirit. I didn't write the Bible. It's there. Go read it for yourself. Even Peter says, why have you allowed Satan to conceive this in your heart, to lie to the Holy Spirit? Do you not know you have lied to God? And he fell dead. All because they sold their house and they chose to lie to God about how much, like God didn't see how much money they got for their house. That's why Peter says, do you not know it was yours? Don't lie to God. You, you, God knows everything. He sees everything. Don't, don't think that God is mocked by not being able to see what you're doing or thinking. He even knows your thoughts before you do. So I warned you about your thoughts before you make them active. Then he did the same thing to Sapphira later. He simply said, this is Peter, which means church. Peter represents the church. That's why I call him the rock. He represents the church. We're to be like Jesus. And he gave him the keys, didn't he? The keys to hold back the words of the devil. And a nice, or Sapphira comes. 
Sapphira comes, and what happens with Sapphira is Peter simply said, did you sell your house for so much? And she said yes. And so the Holy Spirit spoke through Peter and simply said, as your husband, as those who buried your husband are standing at the door, so they shall take you out and bury you with him. And she fell dead. The Holy Spirit took her breath as he did Ananias. Her lion and blasphemy in the Holy Spirit. There's no forgiveness for them. They lied to the Holy Spirit in Peter. This is a serious teaching that people really need to get a grip on. You better be careful what you say. And you better tell the truth from now on because God's listening. And do not come against somebody who has the Holy Spirit in them, like Jesus, who cast out a devil. And the scribe, Pharisees and lawyers that were right there said, yeah, he cast out the devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub, who hates the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And this is who has taken over the church yes. and done away with the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But he is being dealt with by Jesus now. This spirit is, is a, it's a principality and power. And the spirits, there are many Beelzebub spirits, but there's a principality and power, just like Jezebel. I've been told there's only one Jezebel. I said, what? I killed Jezebel. I said, it was a deliverance ministry. It's impossible. You killed a Jezebel, yeah, but you did not kill the Jezebel because it's a principality and power. Right. And it seeks to convert, literally, convert the church to um, perversion. And does it especially prophetically. That's what Thyatira was all about in, in the book of Revelation. Okay? And God said, I will make you, if you partake of the food of the prophetess Jezebel, I will cause you to lay down in a bed with her. Fornication, perversion. And I will send you and cast you into great tribulation. And those who will not give place to Jezebel, or who will speak spirit of life, and after having done all, take a stand in the true gospel. And the real Jesus Christ. I will break you to shivers. What? Sounds like punishment. No. It's a blessing. Because being broken to shivers brings you to a place that your flesh has broken you. It no longer has a hold on you. Being broke to shivers means there's nothing that has its cause or its fangs in you. There's no more connections whatsoever to this world or to the demonic realm whatsoever. You can honestly say it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. That's being broke to shivers. And they are the blessed ones. People do not realize when you are tormented, when you are persecuted, you're being honored by God because you have blessed his son. That's why Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Was not Jesus blessed? Did not Jesus get honored by honoring the Father? Well, the Father honors us the same way when we hold the Son up and we honor Him. Amen. That's what causes persecution. You're obeying God. When you obey God, when you obey God, you will be persecuted. You pray through the Holy Spirit, you will be persecuted. You do war and the anointing of Jesus Christ, Jehu, prophetic anointing, you will be persecuted. And yet the Bible talks about your great tribulation you shall enter in. This is God's love. What? What are you talking about? It's God's love. Because this is what it takes to break the flesh when it's in control of you. It's called mammon. Mammon is self. You cannot serve God and yourself. You cannot seek what you want. But God will always make sure you have what you need. 
So we're coming to a place of great decision. And this series of teachings, and I'm not the only one teaching this stuff, but what I'm sharing with you is what I've been taught in the Spirit by the King of Glory through the Holy Spirit. God took me up into his mind one day. I asked, there's a room, three-sided room, which also represents the Holy Spirit with a holy, there's a little fire on it. The Holy Spirit and fire given by the Father and the Son. It's the table that Jesus had at Leonardo da Vinci's got it all wrong. He didn't sit at a table like that. It was a U-shaped table, and he came in and served him. He sat over here, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. He was used to give the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given by the Father through the Son, but the Son asked for the Holy Fire from the Father. Clovitones. It's a Hebrew symbol of the Holy Spirit. It looks like an inn with a notch on it, or a, a flame above it. I got a symbol. I know you can't see it, but I got one on my chain. we got to come to this place that God wants to serve us up what the Father promised us. If you don't give place to the Holy Spirit to take over your life, you're not going to get them. You can make your tithes. You can live by Malachi, Old Testament, or you can live by the New Testament. And if you go look in the New Testament, look out. You're going to get a little nervous here because you sell what you have until all has equal. Barnabas sold his house and gave to the apostles and distributed as was needed. You look in Acts 2, you'll see the people selling what they had to give to those who had need till they all had equal. That is God's will to be done, not Malachi. We are the storehouses. We're, we're the storehouses. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> houses built by God's hands, not man. If you do Malachi, which is fine, it's you first fruits do belong to God. They do. That's very clear in the Bible. He gets first fruit of all things. And most people just give a tithe. But if God's asking you to do more than that, then you do more than that and watch what God will do with you. And watch what God will give you <coughs> in due season. These are principles that need to be retrained and re-spoken to people. And I'm not one that usually preaches, on, but this needs to be spoken. We need to get to the New Testament teachings and leave the old alone. First fruits, we are the first fruits of Jesus Christ. He was, the, he was the first seed planted and the corn stalks grew up. And look at all the seeds in the corn. And they all got planted. And look. And they all got planted, and look, and they all got planted, and look. That's the perpetual prayer of John 17 that Jesus gave when he was here. It's still in place today. And we are blessed to be part of that prayer. <coughs> we are his first fruits. Salvation is a proof of his death, resurrection, ascension, glorification, and release and enthronement as the King of Glory. The Holy Spirit is the evidence that it has been fulfilled. What Father himself said needs to take place before I can release. If you don't have Jesus, you are under the law, period. And there is no salvation for you under the law. There is no salvation in the law. None. Only in Jesus Christ and his blood. The Lamb of God. Period. And I know they got laws that says you can't preach. And they're going to be implemented. They're in the world court. and They're, they're in the United States too. They're in Canada. They're all around. And they passed these laws that you cannot preach Jesus Christ as the only way to heaven. It is a felony. And they can even come in and take your children. And all that you have. And send you to prison. They put it in there for the new world order. Now you know why in the book of Revelation it talks about that we will be arrested and tormented for 10 days those who God allows to try and get us to renounce Jesus Christ. If you will not, you will be beheaded. Just like 
the grave clothes. And they were in two piles. There was the head and there was the body. The reason he did that to show that he will be separated from the body, though he is with us. We got covering as the body because of the head. Jesus Christ is our head. He is not a figurehead. He is the king of glory in our lives, period. And when you serve a king, he is sovereign. His word is law. But praise God for grace and compassion. And we still have the mercy of God, too, the Father. But those outside of Christ Jesus, they can have mercy, but they cannot have grace. Five is the number of the blood covenant to remind us that through the blood only can we have grace. It is not the number of grace. It is the number of the blood covenant which grants us grace. And the church has changed things to do away with the blood covenant, which is the power of God. It is the greatest spiritual weapon we have. It is the love of God. The opposite of love of God, the Creator, is evolved. Think about that. The opposite of God is dog. And you'll never hear, I've never in 25 years heard this ever preached in the church <clears throat> behind any pulpit or meeting anywhere other than what God has me do this. And I try and use it to, God uses it to wake people up. And I try and make people understand what's being said. You've all heard the, the verse, you, you know, do not cast your pearls before the swine lest they turn and rend you. Right? So what's the beginning of that verse? That's part B. You don't hear this taught anywhere. Do not put the holy thing before the dogs. Or those who are contrary to God. The opposite of God. Do not put the holy thing before the dog. Cast not your pearls before the swine, lest they turn and rend you. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. He is the holy thing. And if you speak his name, and you stand for him, they will not like you. Everybody's used to him, and somebody, you know, especially when somebody sees you, say, God bless you. Why don't you try so you want to see how powerful the name of Jesus is and how it affects things? Say Jesus bless you. Yep. Yep. Stop saying I love them to death and start saying I love them to life. Jesus the Father and the Holy Spirit loves us to life. To life. We've come to that place of change. It's not a request. It is a commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring his body back in to submission of the Holy Spirit, to his obedience, who runs the body of Jesus Christ. It's time for him, us to give him absolute place in our lives and be willing to walk away. And a test of that is, imagine Jesus coming to you. He's out in front of you. Everything, your whole life is behind you. Family, wife, husband, money, all your bank accounts, credit cards, your job, your house, your car, everything you own is behind you. And Jesus says, do not turn back, but come and follow me now. Walk away. It's your test. He did this on me. And it's hard. And he kept doing it until I realized I have so many things in my life that are like bungee cords to me. And he started cutting them and removing them through deliverance and healing. Anything that would, you would think of, other than just following him, and everything didn't matter. Anything that comes to your mind the minute that is said to you, write it down. And God said, that is an idol. Because it gets in between you and him. 
and absolute obedience. Absolute trust. Trust is spelt with the beginning of Jesus' cross. And it's his cross. Trust is not just given, it's earned. You walk it out. Belief is given to us by the Father to receive the Son. Faith is given by the Holy Spirit as we learn. 30 and 60, right? Now the hundredfold is trust. It's earned. It's Jesus. And it's his throne. He enthroned you. And he teaches us how to rule and reign. That's how we really come to a place of realizing the tr that we can trust him. Because he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows how to do it, when to do it. The whole When he came here, everything was perfectly orchestrated. He was the architect of this. And the Father's will is the one that released it. He came to release the plans of God. Perfectly architectural. Everything perfectly placed. Because he knows everything. Now it's our turn. As the body and bride of Jesus Christ, as his family, we must stop what we've been doing, put religion down, put your life down for at least long enough and sit like Mary with Jesus Christ and find out exactly what he wants of you and what he needs to do with you in order to get you to a place that he can give you all the spiritual blessings from the Father. Because right now there are so many things in front of the body of Christ that's divided it and shifted it way out of position with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is no longer the head of the body as a whole. And the Holy Spirit is about to change this. And believe me, the fire of God is coming. And it will be the glory of God. And when that glory of God hits this time, the fire of God is going to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all over with each of us. And we're going to be in the furnace and he's going to purge everything out of us that, hand, that binds us hand and foot from Amen. following and glorifying him no matter what he asks of you, including your life. Amen. That's what's here. And God will take care of us. Now, I'm not telling you to run out and get rid of your job. No, that's not my job. Your job is to go to God and ask Him exactly what He's asking of you. You need to go to Jesus Christ and find exactly what He needs you to do that fulfills His will for you, which will be in exact alignment with the Father, because they're one. you got to find out where you're at with the Holy Spirit. Are you really a thousand percent obedient to the Holy Spirit? If not, repentance needs to take place. You need to seek forgiveness. If you're angry at God, it's okay. He does not hold that against you. He understands. Believe me. I know. My walk with Jesus Christ, I shook my fist at him more than once because of what I was going through. But he understood. He knew it wasn't me. For 24 years, I called him a liar because I didn't believe what he said about me. Who I am and what I am and what he's given me and what he wants to do with me. What about you? You believe everything that God has told you? The things that shake you the most, do you go and ask other people to pray for you to confirm what God said? Or do you just plain deny it? If you do, you just call Jesus Christ a liar. Such hard teaching, but it's real. God does not condemn us for it. He understands. He loves us. But he wants us to understand. He means what he says. He cannot lie. He cannot tempt any person. Says man, but that represents, man represents the heart. Eve represents the mind. And it's a constant battle. The devil wants to, to overcome your heart, to shut you down, to steal, kill, and destroy what the Father promised us in Christ Jesus. So the question is, how big is your God? The second one is, do you really trust Him? And if so, how much? The third one is, yes, the Father, the Son. And the next one is, what place does the Holy Spirit have in leading you in life? 30, 60, 100, or 1,000? 1, 1,000 is a chosen person. And no matter what happens, God is first. No matter. He lay your life down. 
Every penny you have is his. You ask him literally. Sean and I both, we ask the Lord what he wants. With every penny we get, no matter what it is, we ask God, what do you want to do with this? It's his, it's not ours. Everything we have is his, not ours. And he's pruning it out of us. He said, I need you to be flexible. I want you to be prepared to move at any moment I want, to prepare to go worldwide and take nothing with you. That you can move at any time and not worry about nothing. It's not easy. But he's doing it. You know, as I said, he's doing it. Because without him, we can't do it. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. And that's something you need to write. Apart from him, I can do nothing. I hear it taught that you are nothing. That's a lie. We're everything to God. Do you understand that? Mm. You are everything to God. Amen. I've heard it said that if there's no one else on this earth, Jesus still would have come to save you. Amen. And that's a true statement. That's how much God loves. And the power of God is twofold. It's not just the just God, but it's also a righteous judgment. Remember that. God is a just God, but he's also a righteous judgment. He has to judge righteously. He cannot be a respected person. That's what Ananias and Sapphira is about, and King Herod. And we know it was Jesus because there was an angel involved. <coughs> Acts 12. And to bring the fear of the Lord back into Israel, Herod was standing, King Herod was standing in front of all of Israel, arrayed like a god, it says. And they hailed him as though surely he is a god, and he let it happen. So Jesus sent an angel, and the angel tormented him first, and then killed him. In front of the people, manifested, and I believe we're going to see this soon. I'm not going to say the Lord said, but I've heard prophecies and I've seen visions. This is real. We need to get real with God. And we need to let God get real with us. And with that, I'm going to end. Father, in the name of Jesus, grant us the ability by the power of your Holy Spirit to literally get real with you. <coughs> Stop candy coating things. Stop seeking our ears to be itched, Lord God. But we ask you, Lord, also to get real with us, with spirit and truth. Talk to us without any hesitation, Lord. Speak to us, spirit and truth, Lord, that we can receive it, Lord God. And then show us what to do with it. Release the gifts of the Holy Spirit in us, Lord, to receive the ability through the giftings of the Holy Spirit which you've given as gifts to us by your very breath to come into a place of, of absolute obedience that you will be glorified, Lord Jesus. And Father, you will be pleased with us. And thank you, Father, for loving us so much that you sent your love, that through your love we can learn how to love you back. And at the same time, learn how to love each other. Lord Jesus, teach us how to get back into divine order with you. That you are literally the head of us. Not just a head or a figurehead. But you are sovereign, king of glory. And we serve you as such, as much as we love you as our best friend. We bless you, Lord, today. And I ask you, Father, right now to bless all who's hearing these things. Bless them with spirit and truth, Lord. Not just because it's spoken, but because it's true. Touch your people, Lord. Love on them in ways that they have not thought about. Sanctify them as it needs to take place, Lord. To bring us into the fullness and holiness of your Son, Jesus Christ and you're willing to be done to glorify him for who he really is and what he really is. Holy Spirit, we thank you for this day and for this moment in time for speaking to us. We thank you and glorify you, Lord Jesus. Father, thank you. In Jesus' most holy, precious name, amen. <laughs>